recording on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Jim Ruggiero. Today is Friday the 14th. Uh, happy Valentine's Day and Nash Wednesday for those who celebrate it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what ended up happening over the last uh, week and a half or so where uh, we saw some of the uh, uh, inverse uh, volatility ETF and ETNs uh, just implode. Um, a um, Quick disclaimer before we end up getting started. Um, Capital Discussion is not a broker dealer investment advisor. We're not making any trade recommendations during this presentation. Uh, uh, trading options and derivatives is extremely risky, as you'll find out during this presentation. You should be aware of all risks prior to placing any trade. Uh, since we have no way of knowing your situation, we're not making any recommendations specifically for you. Um, please be aware of all risk prior to placing any trades. And with that, um, we, quite, we had quite a... Um, quite a little move uh, in what ended up happening with this implosion. So I figured I'd end up uh, going through uh, a bunch of questions, okay? Um, you know, what ended up happening to the stock markets? Uh, why were these volatility products uh, so popular? What went wrong, okay? How they ended up exploding, what the fallout is, and what's next? Um, <clears throat> when we take a look at what ended up happening in the market, uh, there was just a, a, a relatively big sell-off on the um, 2nd of February. The markets ended up selling off basically on some concerns. Uh, in and around the payroll data showed that there was wage inflation. There was some concerns uh, that inflation would end up being a lot worse than we ended up thinking. Matter of fact, we saw that this morning, right, with the CPI report. Um, and the selling pressure just kind of built on itself. Um, as we broke through certain levels, uh, selling pressure just exploded. Um, it was compounded by a bunch of different reasons. Uh, mostly it was uh, the momentum traders, the high frequency guys, the algo guys, the computer guys. They all rushed out of their short vol trade uh, and the market ended up going down and they can end up flipping, okay, from being long vol to short vol. Uh, in, or short vol to long vol in this case, uh, in, in an instant. Um, the VIX was up over 100%. It was the single largest move in the history of the VIX. Um, it had never moved more than about, I think it was 64 um, points, the most that we had ever moved before on the VIX. Uh, it was just, um, yeah, it's, it was 64 points. Uh, we've only had three moves uh, since the VIX was invented, where it's moved more than 50% in a day. 64%, uh, 51 uh, happened twice. We had that 64% move, by the way, last August, uh, when um, a year ago in August, so a year and a half ago at this point, when there were concerns that uh, um, China was uh, you know, going to end up um, not growing the way we thought it was. And there was a big sell-off then that happened within four days. And so this has kind of become the new norm, especially with the amount of uh, high-frequency trading and algos and how crowded trades end up getting. Um, so it was um, a huge move. Now, what ends up happening with the VIX, okay, the VIX futures, um, and the VIX-based ETFs is that they employ a huge amount of leverage. Um, also, the VIX, most people don't think about the VIX moving on a percentage base, right? They think, oh, okay, well, it wasn't that bad, was it? You know, so we, we ended up going from, uh, during the trading day, we went from wherever we were, you know, uh, about 15 up to 30, okay, um, but what they didn't end up realizing is that even though we think about VIX in levels, if you're in uh, the VIX futures or a, uh, a VIX-based ETF or ETN, these things move in percentages. Now, the percentage move higher in the VIX and the VIX futures uh, truly outpaced the amount of decline that we had. Yeah, I know that a 4% uh, uh, is a huge amount to move, but what ended up happening is that when everybody rushed out of their short vol trades, uh, the pressure on buying vol just got to be extraordinary to the point where, um, you know, with all but uh, one day, we doubled. And was it even? Uh, 200, no, uh, the only day where we didn't have double the increase in VIX in history was last August. That was it. 
okay? So think about what a massive move this was. Um, if you guys have heard me speak about these things in the past, I've mentioned that, uh, you know, last August, I think, is the new norm, where we would end up going through these periods of, of just um, very, very low volatility for long periods of time, um, and then it would pop. Well, the thing is that during those low periods of volatility, Okay, people ended up realizing that there was just a, a great way of making money on that. And that was to end up um, buying the inverse VIX products. Um, I've seen a lot of analysis that people would talk about. Well, you know, some people would say, well, depending on how you end up looking at beta, okay, that the XIV or the SVIXI had, you know, a four beta or a six beta or an eight beta compared to the S&P. Um, and the challenge is that, that it's really, I don't want to say it's not related. Of course, it's related, but it's not a direct function. Remember, the direct function was the difference between the front month and the second month vol. Okay, so when we take a look at the VIX futures, okay, the three numbers that people are always talking about is where's the VIX spot price, right? Because there is no cash because you can't trade the VIX. Uh, where's the front month VIX futures trading? Where's the second month VIX uh, uh, futures trading? And so we ended up having these products that, that uh, people didn't truly understand. Okay, this, if you guys have heard me speak about this, I, I would end up venturing that at least 90% of investment professionals that get paid okay to end up selling you products or manage your money don't understand how these products work but a lot of them ended up using them um, so they had no idea of the warning signs uh, when these products got to end up being um, I'm gonna call them risky okay um, and they didn't care about it because we ended up having a record low volatility uh, in real terms, real volatility um, in 2017. Um, there were a lot of VIX products that not only used leverage, meaning used the futures, but then they were those that were, were two and three times leveraged within the ETF. So it was like multiplication on type of multiplication. So the leverage was just insane that people didn't realize just how much volatility they ended up moving. But as long as they take a look at what the, uh, the daily movement of the XIV is or how it ended up moving over the last year, oh, look, we definitely need to end up um, um, rushing into this because of how easy it is to end up using. And what ended up happening is, is that those ETFs just made it really, really easy for retail investors and quite frankly, a lot of even investment professionals, okay, who weren't volatility specialists to use these products and they went up for years and people were happy with them. And, you know, everybody ran fat, dumb and happy because the distribution of returns was so low. What I mean by distribution of returns is how much did the market, the S&P, move in a single day? And you take a look at that percentages. Give me one second. You take a look at the percentage moves on a daily basis, and then you map it into a bar chart, okay? And when you map that into a bar, bar chart or into a line chart, it looks like a bell curve, okay? It looks just like this. Uh, some of you have seen this before. This is work that I had done and I still end up doing for uh, a company called EAB. It was the company that was formed by uh, an ex-Goldman guy who, um, who basically what they build is they build – um, hedges, custom hedges for institutions, uh, for family offices, for uh, pension plans, for endowments, for other hedge funds or mutual funds. And one of the things that we need to end up always taking a look at is uh, what implied volatility is and what the SKUs end up saying and how to end up uh, getting the best hedge on, okay, in any given environment. And that's the whole thing. Some people think that, oh, you can end up just buying the same hedge all the time. I'll end up buying this butterfly below the money or I'll just buy this teeny put. Well, buying a teeny put when the VIX is at 50 and the SKU is still steep is throwing away your money. Unless the world ends, that thing is not going to pay off. Um, you end up buying a teeny when vols are, at, you know, when the VIX is at nine and the, and the put skew is very flat. Oh my God, what a great hedge that is. If it's super steep, you need to buy a vertical. So this is what we ended up doing. But one of the things we needed to know is what did the distribution of returns? If I take a look at the daily returns, 
and I drop them into a bar chart, uh, I'll have a percentage of number of days that we had, you know, a 0% move or between, you know, a, a 0.25 and a 0.57. So there are these 100 buckets that we ended up just dropping the distributions into. Now, there was the argument uh, that uh, many quants and, and even traders made that said, it's silly to look at the distribution of returns because it hasn't changed for millenniums. If you take a look at from the time that uh, markets started in this country or even in Europe, and you ended up mapping what the daily returns would end up being, you would end up seeing a pretty standard bell curve. So what you see here in all of history is the all the s p history that we ended up having right so i took a look at from when it began in 20 in 1950 through uh, the beginning of uh, 2018 and that's this blue line of distribution so this little point right here says that approximately you know 21 percent of the days okay we're going to have something that goes uh in between i guess i guess i can't end up seeing it so i guess in between um um a quarter a percent and a half a percent, let's say. And then if you take a look at the next point down, it's going to end up being, you know, uh, um, tw right over here, 19% of the days were between um, minus 0.4 and minus 0.7 or between zero, uh, zero 0.07, right? So each of these is a bucket in, in, this, in this graph paper, if you will, or in this chart. I then ended up looking at the market um, the bullish market after the financial crisis. Now, I eliminated all of 2009 and half of 2010 because we had a fair bit of um, volatility on the bounce back. And so on the bounce back, I wanted not to end up showing that we had, you know, a lot more days. And so I thought it was fair, much more fair to take those higher volatility days out um, and to end up seeing what we ended up looking like during this bullish period. Well, this is in the red line and you can see the dates I went from uh, halfway through July of 2010 through the end of 2016. And that's the blue line. And I heard from, you know, the quants and the ex Goldman guys, you see, it's identical. It's a waste of time. But there were just too many days where we kept seeing the volatility be a little bit lower and things would end up happening. And so we kept on with this. When you take a look at all of 2017, right, you can see that over here in the green line. Look at how many more days we had where the move was tiny. And if you take a look at moves that would have been a little bit bigger, you know, let's say more than um, uh, plus or minus, um, you know, three quarters of 1%, those number of days, okay, both on the, especially on the downside, but also on the upside, were many, many fewer. Um, you know, I have all the statistics here. So if you want to take a look at what the average uh, day was, all days, you can end up seeing that all of history was a plus 0 0.03 uh, during the bullish market, which you would end up expecting. It's a little bit higher. Um, both in the 2010 to 2016 red line and in the 2000, 2000, I'm sorry, 10 to 2016 red line and the 2017 green line. But here's where the real interesting stuff comes in. If you take a look at the average days on just, I just took a look at the average down days on the bullish market, they were almost identical. In 2017, it was less than half. If you take a look at just the up days in all of history, Okay, again, it was half that of what it had been previously. If you don't like averages, if we look medi at the medians, okay, uh, the medians had the same type of even a bigger effect, which meant that we even had more smaller days because the median, okay, had a smaller number in 2017. And in standard deviations, you see the exact same thing. So, you know, we, we kind of talked about how 2017 was the year that volatility died. Okay, and being long the XIV or the SVXC or shorting the VXX or, you know, playing any of the inverse ETFs on volatility or shorting any of the long ETFs on volatility was a money-making strategy for a long period of time. So, what went wrong? Um, because these VIX-based products Okay, the inverse ones I'm talking about specifically here, uh, were a bet on that volatility would end up remaining low and also we would remain in contango, right? Contango is when um, 
can tango in the futures is when the front month volatility is lower than the second month volatility. That's really how those products, the inverse products, would end up making their money. And uh, there was a bet that uh, we would end up staying in that uh, lower volatility environment and volatility wouldn't spike up and we wouldn't go into backwardation. And for the most part, we lived down there. Um, we're normally in contango. If you look at history, roughly 90% of the time, uh, we lived in contango like 99% of the time uh, for, for, you know, a, more than a year and a half. Um, it seemed that we were never even approaching backwardation. And the further in contango, remember that that's the futures, that, that the front month was lower than the second month. The further that we, we had that environment happen, the more the uh, XIV and the SVXE ended up going up and the more uh, the VXX and the other, in, the other volatility products ended up dropping. Um, the challenge, okay, that ended up happening uh, was that uh, when volatility spiked on February 2nd, when we had other spikes before, but it really put investors on edge. There was some economic data that ended up turning things. And while the market went down, many investors who were in these short volatility products, okay, got out which means that they were driving volatility up and other traders got into uh, VXX or the other long volatility products. Uh, we, okay, uh, we being uh, Volvantage, okay, the Volvantage Trade Service got long the VXX when this happened on February 2nd. Uh, um, our indicators turned in the morning. It's a trading system that only ends up uh, doing end of day type trades. So we had to wait to the end of the day. We almost had it on Thursday, which would have been even a nicer gain. Uh, but we did get long on Friday um, when volatility started to pop. And what happened was that um, as the volatility ended up uh, moving, we moved incredibly. Um, we actually ended up moving a total of about 116% uh, in the after hours. Um, and most of the move in the VIX, okay, and the VIX futures, or a big chunk of it, happened at the very end of the session and at, at, um, at, um, at, on Monday, the following Monday, is when things just kind of exploded. Okay, uh, the proliferation of all of these short term volatility products and people who were running these types of strategies and the algos and the high frequency traders, they just made, okay, the trades, uh, you know, they exacerbated the price swings uh, because liquidity was just so plentiful uh, in this um, it was easy for people to end up trading. I have mentioned to you guys before that uh, when I went back and I did some consulting work a few years ago um, uh, in the financial industry, in and around, by the way, not in and around trading systems, but to help large companies with their, uh, their accounting of their trading systems. Uh, when I worked with uh, two high frequency trading firms, um, their commission bills, okay, on the CFE, which was ba basically means on their VIX, okay, futures, um, was the largest commission bill of any exchange. And think about this, they were trading one product on this. Um, it was a product that they all played in. There was just a huge amount of, of slippage uh, that these uh, trading firms would take advantage of every single night. Um, and it made it easy for retail uh, traders to end up um, trading this. Um, the market capitalizations uh, of those VIX products, as I end up saying, they, they just absolutely ballooned. So now what happened, you've heard this one, right? Right? You've heard the tail was wagging the dog. Because of the VIX is a derivative and it's very leveraged, okay, in, in its nature, um, the collapse of these uh, short-term products had a major impact on the VIX futures and on the market itself. Um, because of the leverage that they ended up having, even though there was a small amount of money compared to the rest of the market, obviously, um, that uh, it just had a massive move. Um, it triggered so that um, it triggered um, 
and triggered events uh, that were listed in the prospectuses uh, that both uh, Credit Suisse and Nomura had on some products uh, so that they could end up delisting them and they can take them off. Um, I can tell you that there were trading firms that made a huge amount of money because as these things started to end up going, uh, they would end up uh, getting short the inverse products and then they would end up just hedging it out 100% with the futures and as it went down okay they just made money because the 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 products broke uh they were decoupled and that whole run down there, there were um there were algo and computer-based trading systems that just uh you know capitalized on the loss of mainly the retail investors okay um what ends up happening next <laughs> Um, you know, the, these tracker funds, okay, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to track the VIX. Um, there are inherent errors in these things. If you guys have seen the long-term chart of like the VXX, which was the, you know, it's the granddaddy of all of them, um, and you try to map that to the VIX, uh, you end up seeing that uh, the VXX has lost like 99% of its value. Why can't um, why can't there be a product that tracks the VIX? Because that's the way these things are sold a lot, a lot of times, right? Oh, they track the VIX, so therefore you, and if you want double the VIX, you go into the UVXY or, you know, and there's a ton of other products also. <clears throat> the problem is that it stems from the fact that these funds, okay, well, nobody actually, can actually trade the VIX. So what they have to end up doing is that they use VIX futures to try to make a pseudo product that ends up looking like the VIX on a daily basis. The challenge, okay, in, it, in a nutshell, is that the VIX doesn't have an expiration date and futures do. And so since futures have an expiration date, um, they don't have to track the VIX identically except for on the day that they expire, right? Because that's how they settle. Uh, but now investors are free to end up, and the markets are free to end up pricing volatility where they really think it should be and not where um, uh, some calculated index that the SIBO invented, okay, uh, decades ago, meaning the VIX calculation. And so what ends up happening is that you have these very small funds that end up having a tremendous amount of activity. If you had looked at the short interest on some of these things, sometimes the short interest was more than 100% of the actual float. Um, it was incredible, okay, the way these things were, were traded and, the, and a lot of the institutions were in them. Um, and so you had this, I'm gonna call it abnormal positioning, okay, that the, uh, the, mar the derivative markets had because of these retail products that had very specific rules, right? Every single day they had to keep their future expiration date or their days to settlement at 30 days, which meant that every single day, if they had, right, the, the example that I always give is that if the front month, and I'm making these numbers up, right, because this couldn't be the way it actually works, but the math works easily. If the front month expiration was in 15 days and the back month expiration uh, was in 45 days, okay, and we had 50% of each of them, that means that we would have an average of a 30-day expiration. But what happens tomorrow when the front month goes down to 14 and the back month goes down to 29? I, I'm sorry, down to 44. Well, the average goes to 29. So what do they have to do at the ev end of every day? Well, they have to end up selling some of those front months and buying some back months so they can make the new average 30 days again. And the inverse does the exact same thing, okay, but, but with minus signs in front of everything, right? And so every single day, the VXX is selling the front month and buying the back month. The inverse ones, like XIV, is doing the opposite. It's buying the front month and selling the back month. And, and if we're in contango, you know, uh, 98, 99% of the time, they're making money on that daily roll every time. But these rolls are published, um, right? They're, they're part of the, they're part of the uh, prospectuses. Um, their rules when they do this are published. And the funds have to end up getting these things done. And everybody knows that these rolls are gonna happen. And so what ends up happening? The, the bid-ask spreads out, widen out a little bit, and so 
the funds end up having more, I'm going to call it more trade slippage, uh, because why? The high-frequency guys are, are feasting uh, on their carcasses, if you will, right? They, they're making a ton of money on, on these things. And so what ends up happening with this is every single day, um, these things end up moving a little bit, a little bit more because of the contango or the backwardation. And so that's why they were so, so popular, but, but that, that's gone. The reason why, okay, and I see the question here, um, the closing price of the XIV was in the high 90s, okay, uh, why did it only go down a little bit during the day? Um, because of here, let me, let me tell you, I can show this to you. Let me bring this over here. And let's go and get a, um, oh, you know what, let me, let me do it on a separate one. Um, sorry, I just need to get, uh, okay. Okay, let's bring this over here and let me get a just chart of the VIX. Let's do this. Uh, let's come over to here and take the VIX right here and we'll just maximize this graph. Okay, and what I wanna end up doing is I wanna end up going to, uh, oh, what can I do here? One minute, one minute. Okay. Okay. Let's highlight the area you guys want to talk about. Okay, so on Friday, right in here, the volatility kind of spiked, right? That this was the, the second. And you could see that we moved up. And at this point, when this happened in volatility, and it also happened in the VIX futures. Um, and let me get rid of what the studies here also. I hit the wrong one. Okay, it's a little bit easier to see now. When we ended up moving up here, okay, is when we ended up getting the signal. And at this point, uh, because the VIX ended up jumping from, you know, like in the 14s to by the end of the day, uh, close to 17, 17 and a half, the VIX futures also moved. I'll show you the VIX futures in a, in a second. Um, on Monday, okay, you can see what ended up happening to the VIX. And now at four o'clock, okay, right here, okay, we were at 32, okay. What caused, okay, everything to collapse was that as they're trying to do their daily roll, okay, things just ended up exploding on it. it they, they exploded on the VIX. And now, this is after hours, so it doesn't look, uh, you know, nearly as, as, uh, as um, bad as it actually was because what ended up happening was that the, um, the VIX futures, let me take that over here, okay, and make this a little bit smaller so we can end up seeing what happened. Okay, and we're gonna highlight the same area. So what happens is that the front month really moves up and the difference between the front month and the second month roll was it just, it killed, right? It absolutely killed, okay, uh, the funds. Now what happened was also with the funds was that it triggered, if the VIX moves more than 80%, uh, is the way most of them were written. It triggered a um, a um, a clause in the prospectuses that said that Nomura and Credit Suisse were able to end up shutting down, shutting down uh, their their funds. Now, once they end up shutting it down, um, you know they can take whatever the market ends up giving them. Okay, because they're they're in the process of shutting it down, and so it imploded upon itself. Everybody tried to sell. Okay, the slippage got worse, and it just kept cascading down and down and down. Um, once that was triggered, and it was triggered because there was a spike in volatility that took us up to uh, 46 in the VIX the next morning. Um, I don't have this is not doesn't show the after hour stuff. Okay, over here you can see the VIX in the after hours. Okay, on Monday got up to over 50. During the day, and this, this chart only has during the day, if I move this over a little bit, you can see that we only got up to 46. So this 46 point is the same as over here, okay? At that point, um, 
we ended up being so far into backwardation. Now, here's what backwardation is in its, uh, in its uh, literal term. These colors of the rainbow that you see here, they are the VIX futures. I tried to make them as close as I could, okay, in terms of the rainbow. The blue line here is the front month. That's the February contract, okay? For those of you who trade it, you know it as VX for VIX, uh, G for February, 8 for 2018, okay? The next contract, which is in March, is in aqua. April is in green. Uh, May is in yellow. Um, and then go, it goes on, right? June, July, and August. And the literal definition is that when the front month contract, in our case, it was February, goes above the next month's contract, which is March. Now, that ended up happening, okay, uh, on Friday. Okay, it happened on Friday, uh, pretty much in the morning. Um, I don't think that the fact that, that they're absolutely perfect, and matter of fact, I know this because I've done so much freaking back testing on this thing, isn't the optimal point to end up, okay, um, buying volatility, but you want to end up buying it when it has enough momentum that you think the volatility is going to continue to end up rising. I got my signals on Friday morning. Uh, as I told you, uh, Volvantage doesn't go into things in the afternoon, so we ended up buying around 345. Uh, and things just, it just kept going up. You could see the difference between the blue line here and the aqua line down here. The aqua line was still the second lowest, right? It, it, the, rest of the, the rest of the curve didn't get messed up, okay? Um, I'm sorry, the rest of the curve didn't get messed up. On, this is Monday, okay? If I'm looking over here at this part over here on Friday is, is where um, we ended up getting in. And because of this escalation and what happened with this huge volatility spike, um, the, the, once that chain reaction started um, on the ETFs, they just, kept, they just kept folding in on themselves until they, they imploded. Um, and like I said, now they're being sold for sal salvage value. Um, for those of you, I know some of you, I've spoken to a few of you that, that had the XIV, um, uh, playing a short volatility trade like this is incredibly profitable, um, but it's not something that you can end up doing without a trading system. Um, the challenge that these products have also for, I'd say, 90, you know, probably 99% of the traders and institutions out there is that there is no data during the financial crisis on these ETFs like XIV or VXX. If you went through the prospectuses and you actually read how they were created, how they had to do their daily role, you could actually end up formulating the, their exact same formula and you could replicate these things. That's what the high frequency trading guys did. Okay, they would end up replicating these things, and if they were ever out of price, they would end up buying the futures and selling the ETF or ETN, uh, or vice versa, which, whichever way they got out of, out of whack, and they got out of whack constantly. Um, the other thing is that if you know how to end up uh, uh, doing values on these things, well, VIX futures started trading back in 2003. Right. So what we did is that we went out back and we calculated, OK, um, end of day pricing, OK, where we where we couldn't get intraday pricing. but We had end of day pricing or intraday pricing going all the way back to 2003. So we saw how these VIX products would have performed through different crises, both bullish and bearish. Um, the XIV had a had a um a risk of of this happening um because what happens is you know volatility can jump much higher than it goes down so when volatility shoots way up the vxx is is not in jeopardy at all right everybody's rushing to buy it not 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 get rid of it so they, they're not going through liquidation matter of fact they, they have the opposite issue how do they end up okay uh creating enough shares for everybody and so if volatility ends up having this type of 100% move, okay, the inverse products, which are losing money during this, uh, would end up, could end up collapsing. Because think about this, if they try to do exactly what the VIX did, okay, um, be the inverse, 
Okay. And the VIX was up 116%. Shouldn't the inverse product be down 116%? Now it couldn't be down 116%, but shouldn't be down 100%. Well, the VIX futures did move 100%, but they moved an awful lot, but they also ended up uh, having the backwardation that just absolutely destroyed them. Absolutely destroyed them. So what ended up happening was that uh, they did not have enough money to end up uh, keeping. Basically, they got a margin call. It is what basically ended up happening. And the margin call was kind of built into, okay, the prospectus that if volatility went up more than 80%, they could shut down the product. And they basically, that's what they had to do for salvage value. Um, so this caused, you know, the, the a huge issue because of, again, what I would call the abnormal positioning of the derivatives, of the VIX derivatives, of the VIX futures, because um, this was a case where the tail got so big that it, it maybe it wasn't wagging the dog, but it was it, it definitely had influence over the dog. Um, <clears throat> this was the first or the worst uh, um, test case since the financial services, uh, uh, since the financial crisis. If I go back and I take a look at the VIX over a long period of time, what I want you to look at is this was the spike that we ended up having in the VIX. Okay, this was the financial crisis. What you're looking at is a monthly chart of the VIX going back to uh, the dot com boom over here. And so, if you take a look at this, this was and and I kept I kept stressing this because look at this August move that we had in late August of 2015. It was because you know some stuff was going on on in China. If you take a look at this one, this was during the European debt crisis, and we thought that we were going to end up defaulting on our debt because of Congress. This had a lot more potential impact for the market than this did. Okay, China was growing slow. Ah, boo hoo. Okay, this could have taken down all of Europe. This, the U.S. could have screwed their credit rating beyond belief, and it wouldn't have been the world's default currency anymore. Okay, and the VIX got up to 48. Okay, look at what happened here. The VIX got up to 50. Okay, I've been stressing this for so long that we're in a new world. Okay, we're in a new world where when volatility starts to move, it can move more violently than we've ever seen before. And I have news for you. Okay, this was a fear of inflation. Okay, move. Okay, that's what it was. I mean, th there was no economic data that said, you know, we should have had the, the type of volatility spike that we did. This was because the trade was incredibly crowded, it was incredibly leveraged, and you had a ton of retail people and professionals also that didn't know what the hell they were doing, and they stayed in these short volatility products when you should have been out of them. Okay, They didn't do their homework, they didn't do their back testing, they didn't understand that they were in a new environment, and they didn't think that this could happen to them. And they just got splattered. Okay. Um, a couple of questions I'll end up taking here. Let me just also, I just want to end up going back to, um, let me go back to the slides here just so that you guys can end up seeing. Okay. Um, as I said, this was the first real, real test, okay, since the financial crisis, and it was on something super minor. Over the past week, we could end up seeing that the VIX futures are starting to, they, they've started, right? They've started to go through a normalization process. We see the market starting to end up stabilizing. What, end, what was the stabilizing factor on all of this? Okay, uh, the stabilizing factor on all of this, and, and I'll get to your other questions in a minute, but, but I want you to end up seeing, uh, the stabilizing factor on this was that uh, we hit the 200-day uh, moving average. Okay, um, let me just put it this way. Let me do a. All right, let's just put in 200 days here. You know what? I can't do it that way. It's not letting me. There's a problem with Thinkorswim. Uh, let me just bring up a, a different one. Do ATRs have it? No, they don't. Um, give me one second. I'm not sure which one does have it. 
Uh, I want to talk about the ATRs in a minute, but let's go through. Um, The, I'm sorry, I thought I had it here, momentum. That's what I wanted to show you. Okay, the 200-day moving average is in uh, this orange right here, right? This is the 200-day simple moving average. Look at the sell-off that we ended up having. We came, we cracked it intraday, and then we ended up going straight up. If I end up taking a look at this on a 15-minute uh, chart, uh, you can end up seeing this was – the intraday portion of it, where we ended up um, blowing through the fifth, uh, the um, the 200 uh, day moving average. This is only a 200 moving average of 15 minutes. So if I end up going back to this chart, you can end up seeing um, this is this is right here. This is the point that I wanted to be able to end up showing you. Okay. Once we ended up going through the 200-day moving average, um, I think uh, the adults in the room, meaning the larger money managers, said, we've been waiting for this pullback to buy this market forever. Okay. Yes, there are some inflation fears, but you know, not a whatever it was, you know, more than a 10% drop in the market. And since we ended up hitting that point on Friday afternoon around uh, 1 o'clock Eastern time of last week, uh, the market has bounced back up and look at the daily ranges from high to low. They've gotten much, much, much smaller. Okay. One of the other things that you can end up seeing is that if I end up showing you from um, the 2016 U.S. elections onward, what you're looking at on this chart right here is a seven-day simple moving average of the ATRs. ATR stands for average true range, and it's the daily high minus the daily low, including if there was any gap from the day before. And you can see that we were stuck in this range between about 8 and 21. And every time we got up to 21, like this point, for example, it was because there was a little bit of sideways movement and a, and a downward move. If you take a look at, at this point here where we almost hit it again, we had a couple of down days. If I take a look at this point where we hit it, we were, were moving sideways. So ATRs almost always move up before a market tanks, almost always. Um, and the danger, Will Robinson, if you guys end up remembering, I did that years ago, okay, with help from, a, from a, a several people. Um, Dave Walton being the guy who actually ended up doing the most work on it, ended up um, showing that many times when you have a market that's running really smoothly and all of a sudden, okay, things, the ranges start to get wider, that's a precursor a lot of times for the market going down. But it usually, like here's another example, it usually ends up happening, the ATRs move higher after we've already moved sideways to downways a little bit. I want you to end up looking at what happened in 2017. In 2017, look at this. We hit and we stayed up here near 21 this entire time, and the market is doing nothing but going up. When the market's going up and the ranges are getting wider, okay, you need to end up realizing and saying, hey, there's something wrong here. Okay. Um, Vol Vantage ended up getting out of our trade. I think it was on the uh, 16th of January. Okay. We started getting a little bit high here. Now, this is not one of the uh, uh, indicators that I end up using, but it did give me confirmation that I, I knew that, that it was the right thing to end up getting out of the trade on the 16th. And the market continued to go up. If I show you XIV during this point, okay, you can end up seeing here on the 16th, okay, we were down a little bit. And we never made a new high. Yes, we bounced a little bit, but we never made a new high, okay? Because the thing is they're not as correlated as you think, it, right? The, the, the volatility of plays are not correlated to the market. They're correlated to the VIX futures. And the VIX futures have a pretty good correlation to the market, but a lot of times the VIX, as you guys know, was going up during this period, not down, right? If I end up showing you in the same period, if I end up showing you the VIX, Okay, look at what happened here from the 16th, okay? We were actually, and even before the 16th when I got out, the VIX was going up. It was going up while the market was going up. That is uh, um, uh, the, 
one of the biggest elephant footprints that I can think of, right? Uh, guys who, who haven't heard me speak, I always talk about um, the large market players. They're so big that if they're going to get in and out of trades, they can't do it without leaving tracks. It's kind of like if you know a herd of elephants go by, they're going to leave some footprints. You can find them, right? One of the biggest clues to an, uh, an elephant footprint that, that something's wrong with the market is that if the VIX is going up and the VIX futures are going up and all the other volatilities, whether you're looking at SKU or the VVIX, if they're moving higher, if they're moving higher while the market's moving higher and you know the vix can be the vix can be a lot more i'm going to call it there's a lot more non volatility institutional money meaning that there there are just regular money managers who are buying puts and stuff uh, if you take a look at the vvix take a look at how it started to end up spiking i mean it started spiking at the end of the year and then and then by the 16th it really spiked Okay, it went from 90 to, you know, 106. Okay, these were all clues that saying, uh-oh, there's trouble ahead. Um, and, you know, the, the I would not, I, and I did, right? I got out of the XIV because we were long XIV for months, okay? I got out of it on the 16th because uh, I didn't know if a spike could really end up happening. So one of the things that ends up happening too with, with these volatilities things is that a lot of people think, well, you can either have to be long or short, right? Traders are usually taught from the time that they're, they're little puppies. Um, you know, great traders can take a long position and turn it short at the right time. Um, and that's the way we tried to end up building our uh, VXX and our XIV trading systems when I was at EAB. And it wasn't until, um, you know, in 2015, after what ended up happening in August, and I spent, you know, months and months looking at things that I finally said, there are some times when it's just too easy to get whipsawed. And so I had a third state, not only long volatility, short volatility, but a third state in cash. And I was in cash up until this day. And at this day is what, when, when we end up getting long because volatility showed me, oh, it's starting to move. Now, what ends up happening, by the way, um, with at least the way I run my long uh, VXX stuff, um, the majority of my trades will be flat scratches or, or small losses, the majority of them. Because many times you see these little spikes, okay, uh, volatility, let me go to the VIX so you can actually see where the VIX was because I know a lot of people, right? So the VIX ended up jumping, okay, like this, and it was like, and I bought volatility. Right. I'm actually it's kind of acting like a long gamma trade right? because I bought VXX many times. What ends up happening is that over the next day or two, whatever was the concern ends up passing and volatility comes back out. Every once in a while, OK, uh, whatever the concern was grows and grows dramatically and the market ends up wanting to buy more volatility, right? more protection, more options, driving the VIX higher. Um, Every once in a while, that ends up happening. And that's what ended up happening here, okay? Um, and it, it, it just, it really, really spiked. Let me go to some of the questions now. Um, and I will, I just wanna leave this chart up. I, I just wanna leave this chart up here. No, that's not the one. I want you to see this. What we're talking because this is the one to me that really ends up showing what ended up happening in the market in the term structure. Okay. And there we go. I wanted to see from Friday onward. Okay, um, the questions. Uh, the use of after hour pricings for the VIX, okay, uh, for managing XIV and, uh, um, and SVIXI products seemed odd um, as it's unrelated to the actual trade of the VIX options. Um, what they have to end up doing is that they do their roles, okay, and their roles were um, specifically said when they were done in their prospectuses um, and they do trade these things towards the end of the day or actually after you know they're trying to they're trying to emulate the final print is what they're trying to do um, 
when things started to get against them and they were short, remember, they're short volatility, right? They're short volatility. So even if they didn't trade, the, spa, the fact that uh, the VIX went up to 51, okay, during the after hours piece and the VIX futures also ended up jumping. Let me, let me show you here, right? Because you want to see the after hours stuff. So let me come over to here and say um, time, um, futures. Okay, apply. Oh, you know what? It's on equities. That's what it is. Because it's thinking that the VIX is uh, an equity. Okay, so let's go to the same thing uh, from Friday and I highlight. So look at what happened with the VIX futures. Okay, so what happens is that remember, remember the XIV is short volatility. It's short these futures. Okay, so what ended up happening during the day, right? Uh, the futures went from 15 to 32 they more than doubled. They're using leverage, okay? What ended up happening when you use leverage like that? If you did this on your own, okay, you'd get a margin call, okay? They ended up having in their prospectuses so that they wouldn't get a margin call because they're, they're using futures, uh, but they had the ability to shut the whole thing down and then it was in liquidation mode. So when you take a look at the period of time and we're talking about that really killed everything, was here, they ended up driving it higher, okay? They ended up driving it higher. And don't you know, right? You know that all of the algos and the computer generated stuff, they knew that if they all teamed up on these ETFs, they could destroy them. And if they destroyed them, okay, by shorting the ETF and, and buying the VIX futures underneath it, they had a perfectly hedged trade that when it collapsed, if you know their long would collapse and their short would just make, uh, uh, um, you know, meaning that they're uh, um, the, the short of the inverse, right? So the short of an inverse is like two negatives. They actually were buying the futures, right? Because inside of the ETF, the um, XIV, they were short the futures. So they ended up hedging everything out. And so they ended up making a freaking killing on this. Okay. The, the algos that ended up doing this. Okay. Um, next question was, uh, um, it's not the pricing of the VIX. Okay. But the VIX futures. Yes. Okay. And that, that's what I end up saying. It is the VIX futures that ended up doing everything. Uh, Mark Sebastian was saying in a webinar that the inverse volatility products that it's theoretically possible. Okay. Per the prospectuses to lose an amount greater than the value uh, of it. Well, yeah, think about this. If it's a single day, okay. Um, price that they're trying to do, right. They're trying to do a single day of the VIX. And so if in a single day, the VIX goes up 100%, you would expect the inverse, okay, product to go down 100%. It went up 116%. So theoretically, it should have gone down 116% if they could have built it perfectly, right? Well, they're using futures and they couldn't end up going to a minus 116%. And so they ended up liquidating and they ended up getting whatever salvage value they could. Um, and by the way, that is on an instantaneous basis, right? Because when they were doing this, it was when, when the VIX was just exploding, okay? So uh, yeah, I haven't spoken to Mark in a long time. I've known Mark for a bunch of years. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was a prospectus, okay? That ended up saying, uh, disregard from him, okay. And so are there any other questions? I mean, I guys wanted you to end up understanding what ended up happening. So why didn't the pro shares, okay, have to liquidate uh, the s -Vixi? Okay, um, when they ended up hedging, okay, uh, the short term. This is the difference between an ETF and an ETN, okay? In a ETF, okay, um, you must own the underlying security, right? Because it is an exchange traded fund, a fund has to have securities in it. And so what the exchange traded fund as Vixie had, okay, um, let me put this over to here. Let's come over to here. Because I want to get, let me get rid of all of these studies again.
Okay, so when I take a look at, at the XIV, okay, you can see here what ended up happening is that uh, when we opened up again, and let me do the 15 minute chart because that's right, right what you guys want to see. Okay, and I also need to end up turning on um, the after hours stuff. Okay, and so this is what you want to see, right? So during the after hour stuff, you can end up seeing that it, 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 that's when the real drop started to end up happening because that's when they were doing the roll. And they weren't sure if they were going to able to break it or not, but they, they did end up breaking it. Okay, and, and we floated down all the way down here. Now, they're closing this because the XIV actually does not own the VIX securities. They don't, right? They don't own the VIX futures. They own notes and they've hired companies to be able to end up emulating it. And there were things in those contracts that ended up reflecting back into the prospectus. Okay, so this ended up losing, uh, what, 95% of its value, where the s only ended up losing about, um, you know, 90% of its value versus the 95%. They didn't have to end up shutting it down because the XVIXC is a uh, um, exchange traded fund and they actually owned the security. So while they were doing those trades and volatility was spiking and they ended up losing all of those money doing those rolls, okay, that, that absolutely killed them, um, they didn't have to end up shutting it down. Okay. Yes, the slippage on these things was enormous. Okay. A big chunk of this thing was because the funds got attacked, right? During their daily roll, these funds and, and notes got attacked by the high frequency guys. And they weren't able to end up fending it off and they had to end up doing the roll according to their rules. And it's, it's, what, it's what ended up making the s he lose as much value. But because they actually owned the securities, in this case, they're shorted. Um, they didn't end up having their their margin call, if you will, uh, because uh, they ended up having the, the actual securities in their account. Um, other things, okay. To me, the problem, okay, is the front running of the structural problem, okay. And I don't think that the hedge, okay, would have worked in or the swaps. Yes, um, CS knew about the problem. CS knew about the problem. Matter of fact, CS was the uh, uh, one of the ones who, um, they, they ran it, right? They were in control of it, but they also ended up having trading desks that, that ended up uh, trading against it also. And so what was the first thing that, that a Credit Suisse did, okay, when this happened? It said, this won't cause us any loss. Um, they can't come out, by the way, if they're trading desks, whatever they would have lost in the ETF, they ended up making up on their trading desks and then some, okay. Uh, so that was a, uh, that was a problem. Um, IPATH, uh, okay, um, VXX and XVIXC are both, okay, uh, by the same company. One is long, the VIX futures, okay, and the other one, yes. Okay, what ends up happening I I is that, um, you know, the ETFs, there was some reason why some people wouldn't do ETNs because in the end, what an ETN really is, it's, it's backed by the credit worthiness of Credit Suisse. Uh, there are rules that it can end up trading to where it is, but but when it came to would it end up collapsing and folding, if Credit Suisse would have gone under, people said, oh, well, there's a risk of that. Well, there really wasn't because if it was profitable. Credit Suisse would have sold that asset because they were, they were looking to get whatever money they could. Um, it was really with this type of an event where the VIX ended up moving, like they said, it moved up more than twice of any day in history except for once, except for one. And so that, that was a, a huge, huge move on it. Um, what about the future trust for the ETNs? It's a big problem. It's, it's, it's a really big problem. I, I, I don't see that, that trust issue going away. Um, you know, I ended up saying uh, that um, this was the first, right? This was the first uh, crisis that they ended up having to end up going through. But there was other stuff that also ended up going on, okay? Um, the sell-off in the other areas, okay? was kind of muted because it really was uh, confined to, you know, the equity markets. Um, I'll tell you um, that institutional trades um, love this thing and retail guys are done. Okay, I wrote down that the retail traders will probably not come back to volatility products and they're probably not going to go back to ETNs. 
Okay. Uh, the dispersion trade, okay, um, was a really, really big thing. For those of you who don't know the dispersion trade, it's an institutional trade. It's when there's a difference between what the index says will be the volatility of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 versus what the options on each of the 500 volatility end up saying. And then there's a correlation and there's a way to end up uh, saying when, when um, um, index volatility is priced higher or lower than the individual stock. Uh, and it's, it's a trade that uh, all, of the, uh, all of the big guys used to end up doing. Uh, the guy who found it, um, who found it, uh, um, um, EAB, uh, was a, a specialist in this. this. This was what he used to end up doing uh, when he was at, at, uh, at Goldman. Okay, he did the dispersion trade. And so the dispersion trades, okay, um, you know, will, will continue and they'll remain popular. But, but the retail stuff, um, and I think that that's good. I think that that's a good thing because what will end up happening is that it'll keep people out of the trade who don't know what they were doing. I've been asked the question, what am I going to end up doing about um, the Vol Vantage uh, trading system? Because the Vol Vantage trading system that we have at Capital Discussions ends up um, either being long the XIV in cash or long the VXX. I told you, um, and here I actually have it over here. I can end up showing you the actual trade. Okay, here was the actual trade, right? We ended up closing our long, um, our long XIV shares on the 16th of January. We remained in cash, and I didn't go long the VXX. And you can see the long the VXX here on on the second. So what am I going to end up doing, or what do you do if you want to continue to end up trading this? Because um, probably around more than half, 60, 70% of the time. It was, even, it was probably a little bit longer than that during 2017. Uh, of the time, I would be in the short volatility product. I would be in the XIV. Um, I actually chose being long the XIV and being long the VXX so that uh, any Volvantage subscribers could even do this in their IRA. That, that's why I, I chose being long the products. Um, the fact is that when I ran the models and the back tests, shorting the VXX was more profitable than going long the XIV. Remember all of those slippage and commissions that we talked about? Okay. Well, if you're short the VXX, you're short the slippage and you short the commissions. Yes, you have to pay a, a hard to borrow fee, and, and, uh, but the, the performance actually worked better. What do I end up doing? I get asked this question. What happens if, uh, if um, the VXX uh, has a hard to borrow fee on it that, that becomes outrageously expensive? Um, then I can end up using either uh, in the money puts, you know, further out of the money, uh, further out in time uh, in the money puts, or I can use put spreads. Um, I, I also would get asked this question. Is that the most efficient way to do it? No, if I was actually running money, um, I would end up doing it with the VIX futures because then it, I could end up con controlling the slippage. I could end up controlling, okay, when the rolls would end up happening. Um, and if instead of having other hedge funds try to, you know, clip VXX all the time, um, I would be able to end up controlling the world. The problem is that you'd need to have at least 22 contracts, uh, so you're looking over a quarter million dollars, okay, per unit to end up putting this trade on. But that would be the most efficient way to end up running it. Okay. Um, other questions in here uh, were, um, it's not the same in the company. Um, VXX is a uh, Barclay product. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't going to end up getting into the different products are run by different people. And, and, you know, during the whole, whole, you know, movement that these things became popular, uh, new ones came out. So there's just a ton of them. I, I'm really talking about what's going on in general, okay, of an ETN. An ETN has a risk of the underlying manager of it going bankrupt. Okay, I don't, I don't want to, get into dispute about who owns what, who owns what. Um, uh, Mark's, uh, Mark Sebastian's point was that individual investors in the inverse volatility products could lose a large amount of money larger than their credit uh, value. Um, theoretically, theoretically, Mark is correct. Um, uh, um, 
I didn't think it was possible to lose more than what you actually ended up having because of some of the safeguards that were built into the prospectuses, but it was definitely possible to lose all of your money or 90 or 95% of your money, which we saw. Okay. And to a lot of people, it's, you know, if I lose a hundred percent or if I lose 95%, really, you know, it's, it, it, they're crushed no matter how you look at it. Um, why not buy puts on the uh, VXX? Okay. Great question, Cyrus. Okay. Um, when I started with uh, the guys over at EAB, we spent three and a half years trying to build option strategies on the VXX or the uh, or any of the other um, inverse or regular uh, um, or even leveraged products like the two times leveraged uh, uh, a VIX product is the UVXY. So we ended up building uh, all of these different strategies. And in the end, in the beginning of this, um, pricing was so wild that we, we couldn't end up making anything end up working. You know what product worked the best back then? It was buying long-term puts and just holding them. We'd buy long-term put spreads, and it always seemed that we'd always go below, okay, our lower price in the put spread that we bought. You know, we would buy the 100 put, and we'd sell the 75 put, and we'd go lower than that. Then we tried to sell the 50. And see, no matter which one we sold, we always seemed to end up going lower than it. It was because um, the daily roll effect of having to sell, okay, the lower priced front month and buy the higher price second month was much greater than um, many people originally thought it would end up being. And that roll effect had a massive influence over the price. Uh, what's happened with the options, okay, and by the way, we, so we had this great system. Everything was all go. It was going to freaking print money. And literally, you know, within two months of us uh, implementing it with real money, um, the market makers changed the way they priced the puts and they got much more accurate at how much that daily roll would end up affecting and deteriorating the value of the VXX. So what happens is that the puts became much, much more expensive. And so buying those put spreads, okay, became much more difficult uh, or, you know, buying the outright puts or even butterflies. And so when you take a look at that, you have to end up realizing the influence uh, that that daily roll on the negative negativity of the price, um, how that ended up getting implemented and, and included in the actual pricing of the way the market makers would price the puts and the calls for that matter on products like the VXX or the UVXY or any of the volatility products. Okay, so it's it's a it's a it's, it was a, you know it's it's great it's it's exactly what went through our heads. Okay, when when we were doing this, uh, you know, many years ago, um, the daily reset mathematically causes the XIV to underperform the short um, uh, VXX position when uh, when when the VXX is going down, even without slippage. Of course, it does, uh, because if you take a look at and let, let me show you exactly what what we were talking about here. So let me come over to a VXX graph. Uh, you know what? I don't want this one. I want the other one. Okay, I will use this one. Let me go to a VXX graph. And let me go for a long, long time for going back. Okay. Look at any year, okay, where we were relatively bullish, okay? Um, if you take a look, if I just say, say take a look at 2012, right? I'm going to look at 2012 here. You can end up seeing this is a normal path of the VXX. Its amount that it ended up losing is incredible, right? We go from 8,700 to 1,700. What ended up happening during that? Like, for example, let me just end up... Um, showing you and adding two comparison charts just so we can end up taking a look at this. So if I end up comparing uh, the S&P and also let me end up uh, comparing the VIX, All right? Just so we can take a look at it percentage wise. Okay, move. Would help if I could spell, right? There we go. 
when I end up applying this, okay, what ends up happening is that, and I, you know what, I'd have to do it on percentages. So let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. Let me hit apply on the S&P. And let me do one other thing. I have to come over to here because I want this on a different graph. So when I end up taking a look at what's not here. Okay. So here's what you want, want, want you to see. Um, during the time, the, um, the VIX or the um, VXX, and I don't have prices in here. I have to end up doing this one more time. It's over here, sorry about that. I, I didn't have all of these things set up. I should have realized you guys were gonna end up asking me questions on these things. If I come over to here on equities. Where's price? I thought I thought price was, because instead of a percentage over here, I wanted you to end up seeing the price. Um, and I don't know. It's on equities. I don't know. We'll just we'll just deal with. It. We know that we went from eight thousand down to seventeen hundred on on the um, candles, right? Because that was the uh, VXX. On the left hand side, you can end up seeing that the VIX. I'm sorry, that the S and P. That's what we're showing in the purple line here. Went from about twelve hundred up to um, let's call it uh, fourteen seventy, right? Went from twelve seventy five to fourteen seventy. Uh, so it went up about uh, 200 points during the, this year. If we end up going to the following year, right, I'll just move everything up. Okay, we can end up seeing here again, we went from about 1300 up to about uh, 1460. And again, what ended up happening, the same thing keeps happening if you go over periods of time. Every time we end up having a drop in, in the VIX, okay, um, even if in a year like this, say in 2015, and we know that we had that really bad period, okay, you can end up seeing here that the that the S and P went from 2,000 down to like a 1,900 during this period of time, and you would end up expecting right the VXX to end up uh, doing reasonably well. This is about as good as it got, okay. Um, you know, that, that it didn't lose that much value, okay, d during these 11 months or so. What happens whenever you have any type of bounce up, okay, in the market, this thing just absolutely gets crushed. And remember, um, this was, this was uh, in a year when, when the S&P went down. So there, the correlation of it just doesn't work, okay? What you have to end up doing in any of these things is understanding, okay, what drives um, any of the ETFs. They all kind of use the same formula, right? The same formula was that if they were saying that they were um, a VIX-based product, they had to keep their expiration at a constant 30 days, which meant they had to keep the front two months contracts and every single trading day, they had to roll some of the front month okay, to the back month, okay? They were long the front month and they had to go from being long the front month, okay, sell of those which are usually cheaper and buy the more expensive back months. And that daily roll uh, ended up destroying the price. Now, the price, okay, uh, gets hurt even if slippage is zero and commissions are zero, okay? As long as you remain in contango, okay, that will end up hurting the VXX. Slippage and commissions only make that worse. And that's one of the big reasons uh, why the uh, VXX ended up losing more money than the XIV would make. There are other things, right? But don't forget, the XIV also had to pay their slippage and their commissions, okay? Uh, there were other reasons, but but that, that's, that's a big chunk of it. A VXX chart is a back... Um, is back adjusted, therefore, unless you're showing, okay, the prices of money would have lost over time. Yeah, what ends up happening is that when you take a look at this graph in the uh, VXX, these prices, and you know what, let me, uh, let me get rid of uh, this so we can just look at the VXX for that for a second.
Okay, uh, you know what? Let me get get the price again because it's, it's still going to stay stay in percentages for me. Let me just reload the chart. Okay. So what ends up happening in the chart is that these prices are adjusted because of all of the um, uh, reverse splits. You know, the VXX has had a bunch of uh, splits, sometimes uh, a one for 10 split. Uh, and they needed to do that to keep the price down because otherwise this thing would be trading in fractions of a penny right now because it's lost, you know, over 99% of its value. Okay. Um, so the, yes, uh, the, that 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 role is is a much bigger factor than people end up um, realizing. And unless you are doing something um, like watching the futures on a monthly basis and being able to see and know how to calculate that role, you're kind of guessing. You're kind of guessing. Okay. Uh, what ends up happening a lot of times when the volatility spikes up like this, now what ends up happening is that this front month. Like, uh, let, let's go on, well, you know what, even we could even go to today, okay? If we ended up going to today, if we take a look at uh, just today, where we are, okay? Um, the front month now is March, right? Because the thing is that we ended up expiring. Oh, by the way, we expired this morning. What a shocker, right? What a shocker that volatility Okay, and the VIX comes way, way down when the front month contracts that were, were kept very high ended up settling. How many of these high frequency trading firms and institutions owned this future and had it settle out at the VIX price? Okay, or were short that VIX uh, contract. So you get these massive moves in the VIX many, many, many days when you go through expiration. And that's exactly what happened this morning. Okay, um, it's one of the reasons why, even though we're still in backwardation here, remember backwardation means that March in aqua is at a higher price than the green, which is um, uh, the following month, April. So if you take a look at it, and, and if I was to do the math for you, right, right, the, uh, uh, the front month, they're almost even, right? We're slightly in backwardation by maybe about 1% or so, right, by about a uh, uh, two, right, about a, uh, two tenths of a point on 18. So it's a little maybe 1.1, 1, 1.2%. 1, 1 uh, so we are in backwardation still, All right? We are in backwardation still, uh, but it's rather minor. Anyway, I've been going a long time. Are there any last questions? I think we kind of covered uh, everything. Um, there's one more here that I'll go through and write down your questions. Otherwise I'm gonna end up wrapping it up after this one. Um, what I was trying to end up getting to is that the VXX could have unlimited losses, okay, but buyers of the XIV or SVXE can only lose 100%. Um, I think you have that backwards, right? Because um, the VXX is the long volatility fund. So it owns the options, it owns the front month, and it owns the back month. So they could go to zero, but the VIX futures can't go below zero, right? And so they end up having uh, um, um, only 100% that they could possibly lose. Um, whereas the SVIXI or the any of the inverse ones, the SVIXI, the XIV, if we went up 100%, you should lose 100% of your money. So theoretically, if we go up 200%, okay, you should lose 200% of your money. And so theoretically, it was possible, but um, the clauses in the prospectuses shut it down when they lost like 80% of their value because they didn't want that to end up happening. They wanted, if they, if they, if they got a trigger where they would end up losing 80% of their value in a day, they'd shut everything down. Okay, because they, they knew that the role was going to end up being so much. So yes, that, that is theoretically true, true, but they gave themselves a 20% or sometimes more uh, leeway so they could end up closing trades. Okay, um, I, think, I think that that's, uh, um, is it, uh, Jim, I said, sh oh, a short XIV position. Yes, uh, a short XIV position, okay, um, you know, 
you can end up, um, you, you would be short the futures and you could theoretically, being short the, the VIX, you're basically short the VIX futures. So if you're short the uh, VXX, you have the potential of losing more than 100% of your value in a day. Um, and I knew that, by the way, and, and I still know that in, um, in the uh, XIV, okay, trade, I could have lost, uh, I could have lost 100% in a day. Um, but being short these things, what ends up happening, and I, and I showed you this before, what ends up happening is that this doesn't just happen in a day. Okay, we saw volatility start to end up picking up over here. Remember, it was way back, okay, it was way back on uh, the 16th, which is outside of this graph, okay. So I, have the, I don't even have the 16th because I'd have to, and it was uh, outside of the 16th when the volatility started to end up getting to a point where I thought that we should be in cash. Um, you never have everything be perfectly calm perfectly calm and then just have things uh, explode. If you're looking closely, you can start to see little cracks in the armor show up, okay? And what I ended up doing and what, 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 what changed the uh, Vol Vantage made it as, as incredibly um, successful as it's been is because once the tiniest cracks start to show up that it doesn't make sense to be long the uh, VXX or short volatility if you wanna look at it that way, um, I went into cash and I was in cash for weeks until the volatility started then picking up. And then we jumped on the bandwagon once volatility picks up. Like I said, most of the time, those trades are going to be losses. Okay, small losses because it's going to end up moving up a little bit and it's going to end up going back down. But once volatility starts to move, uh, man, that's a freight train. If you're short, you, you got you to gotta get out of it. You, you can't stay in a short, short uh, uh, VXX trade once it starts to move against you. You can end up riding it for a long period of time where it'll lose value, lose value, lose value, and you'll make a ton of money on it, but you do need to end up, okay, once it starts to end up moving, there's certain parameters, and this is what I spent, like I said, five years studying. There's certain parameters that will end up showing you you got to get out of the way of that free trade because otherwise you'll be a freaking bug splat on a windshield. Okay, guys. Um, oh, there's one more here. Okay, so instead of shorting the VXX, how about shorting, um, shorting VXX far out of the money with the call options? Ow. Ooh. Daniel, that, that one's dangerous. That one's dangerous because, uh, you know, yes, you'll end up thinking that your premium's great. And instead of picking up nickels in, in front of the steamroller, you'll, you're picking up dimes, but that steamroller will get you one day. It will get the, the question. The only question of a strategy like that is how long till you go out of business, you'll make money, make money, make money. And then one day, um, you'll be under the steamroller. Um, how many trades per year does Vol, Vol Vantage uh, post for subscribers? Um, I mean, we were in some trades for six months, okay, where we did nothing. And let me see where it was. Uh, and I forgot my averages. Here are the number of trades since April of, uh, of um, 16. So this is a year and a half and what is that? Nine trades in a year and a half, a year and four months. So uh, that's, that's probably pretty typical. What I saw is usually about, um, you know, six to eight trades on average. Every once in a while, we might have 12, but there, aren't, uh, there, there are periods of time when we're just in cash, okay? But by the way, what happens when we're in cash so that you guys know is that every morning I end up doing a, uh, an overview of the market, what our trading plan is, tell you what's going on in the market. We'll end up commenting and give you, you know, directional stuff. So like when we ended up having this big sell-off after the uh, CPI and the re retail numbers came out, uh, okay, I ended up doing the whole analysis and there's my conclusion. Does this appear overdone to you? It does to me. Well, what, what's happened since then? Well, we made up all of the loss and we've gained some. So it's just not the trade. Um, it's also, I think, gives you, uh, uh, um, it gives you all of my thoughts on where, where the market's going uh, and what's driving it. Um, I'll end up talking about uh, the volatility a lot because it affects, but I'll also talk about the indexing pricing and what ends up driving it. Um, yeah, I, I would never short, short calls, okay. Uh, the problem with buying calls is that they're so freaking expensive because the implied volatility is so high 
that um, many times I've seen people buy calls, they were right, the VXX goes up huge, and they make a fraction of what they thought. And so, uh, trust me, I, I said, you know, I, with, with three of the best options traders, ex Goldman guys that, that you're ever going to meet in your life, best that I've ever met in my life, along with, uh, you know, two PhD quants, and we couldn't crack this code. Uh, on how to end up uh, doing options because they kept changing the way they would end up pricing these things. Um, it's unless you're going to be a high frequency guy and take advantage of short term price dislocations, uh, it's really, really difficult to put on, on, on trades that, uh, that make money on a consistent basis. What I found it was a lot easier just using the underlyings getting in and out. And as I said to you before, if I was actually running money, I'd prefer to actually be the one who was buying and selling the futures. Uh, because then I wouldn't have to worry about other things. Um, call spreads on, yes, serious. if you're going to end up buying calls, buying call spreads is the way to go. And the reason why buying call spreads is the way to go is that because while uh, the calls at the money are insanely high, okay, in terms of their implied volatility, the calls of the above the money are even more insanely high. So you actually have IV working for you. So buying a call spread as a way to end up doing it is not is is a, a better way if you're going to buy calls. It's the only way you should ever buy calls on it. But because of the daily roll factor, when we're in contango and we're in contango like 90% of the time, um, it just drives the VXX price down and down and down. And what happens with your call spread if you put it out too long? Um, you know, the value of the VXX could be cut in half. And then when it has this huge jump one day, you only jump back to your original price. And so th that, that's why it's, it's really hard to end up being in the VXX on a regular basis. It has to be a trading vehicle. When the signals tell you so, you have to get in, make your money, and get out. Um, we got out of, just so that you guys end up knowing, okay, when we got out of this trade, I got out of a quarter of the position on basically um, price targets that we hit, limit orders that we hit on Monday after hours. I got out of a quarter of the trade then. Uh, we gave back a big chunk of our value on Tuesday when the market seemed to be recovering. So I basically kind of had a trailing stop and it's not a, a, a trailing stop. It's really trailing indicators that I'm using, but it kind of works like a trailing stop. Got out of it a quarter of it then. And then I got a out a quarter of it on Friday um, at, at a price um, of like 49 and change. And where are we now? We're 44. Oh, okay. These were my day trades, okay? The, the, these, these didn't count. Here was the actual trade. Um, I ended up getting in long our position at $32.64. And let me do this in 15 minutes this way you can actually see it a little bit easier. And then and this really should be the last thing. I've taken up way too much time, guys. Okay. So let me just highlight from Friday on afterwards. So this was me closing out my day trade that I made up money on the day before. Uh, our signals work at the end of the day. So this is my official VXX trade where I got in at $32.64. You can end up, see that was on Friday, okay, right before the close. It's an end of day trading system. So I send everything out after 3 p.m. Um, on this. I'll end up telling you on the day uh, that I end up doing this, I said, you know, the signals are, are negative. If we, if we remain negative uh, and we get a negative uh, ball vantage signal by the end of the day, we will be buying XIV. Well, it got worse and worse during the day. And so, but, but according to the system, I have to buy at the end of the day. I mean, I could have bought it, you know, $2 cheaper. What I did was that when we ended up getting to certain target prices up here at $54, uh, I sold uh, uh, my first quarter, my position at $54. What ended up happening down here is that we lost so much from our peak to our trough uh, that I wanted to make sure that I ended up protecting enough of the profit. So I ended up getting out of another group, another quarter at, um, at um, 40, uh, almost $44. And then I got out of the last group at the end of the day on, um, because this was a limit order. That's why we ended up, uh, uh, you know, basically stop loss, not a limit order, but kind of like a stop loss um, from the peak. Uh, and then I got out of the rest of it at $49 and change on Friday because uh, things just, uh, we didn't have the same wind at our back that we, that we did. And so, 
Uh, the answer to another question. Okay, so I think that's it. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you attending. Um, this will be put up um, um, and I'll also give uh, slides to Tom, so he'll end up having them. Uh, if you want, uh, send me an email at jim at capitaldiscussions.com. That's jim at capitaldiscussions.com. Uh, and I'll try to end up getting to all of your answers, okay, within the next couple of days. Thanks, guys.